Welcome everyone to the observatory of the Cervantes um, Institute in, in Harvard. And uh, welcome to this Teaching uh, Foreign Languages workshop. This is a new year, this is a new uh, semester, and we have new opportunities to host a bunch of uh, events, uh, workshops and activities uh, regarding the Spanish language, the Hispanic cultures and uh, in the United States, and also training for teachers. You, I think, all know very well the Cervantes uh, Observatorio. This is uh, Instituto Cervantes here, and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University created in 2013 this uh, Observatory of the Spanish Language. And uh, among other uh, activities, uh, the Observatorio hosts the DELE exams, the Diploma de Español como Lengua Extranjera, and uh, we also organize workshops and uh, courses for teachers of uh, foreign languages, uh, mainly uh, teachers of Spanish, but not only in Spanish, and uh, many other uh, activities we are offering um, for you all along the semester. Let me just mention uh, a few of them. By February 12th, we have a new teaching foreign languages workshop, um, is Artful and European Framework, uh, framework Equivalences by Jose Ignacio Cayenne, Instituto Cervantes, New York. By February, uh, on February 25th, we have a presentation of a project uh, called uh, Canary Islander in the USA, uh, Canarios in Louisiana. And on uh, March the 4th, we have a conversation, a new conversation in the observatory about the Spanish in the United States and the Spanish of the United States by two big names of the linguistics in, in, in the United States, Ofelia Garcia and Ricardo Otegi, both from CUNY. So welcome to this teaching uh, foreign languages workshops about the Spanish in the health service in the United States. We'll be here until 1.30, uh, more or less, uh, at 11, 11.30, depends on the, the professor. We'll have a coffee break uh, for having a coffee, obviously, or uh, some beverages or, or sandwiches. And by the end of the workshop, we will distribute uh, an evaluation form and a certificate uh, in which you have just to um, write your names. Our guest today is an excellent expert about Spanish in the United States. He is very prestigious and very well known within this field. Glenn Martinez, uh, Martinez is Professor of Hispanic Linguistics and Chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese in the Ohio State University. His research focuses on social linguistics and uh, applied linguistics uh, of Spanish-speaking communities in the United States, and um, also in the in the um, along the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. He has written seminal works in the historical uh, social linguistics in the uh, of Spanish in the Southwest, and he has made significant contributions in the area of language uh, policies affecting Spanish speakers. He has also written extensively on the teaching of Spanish uh, to heritage learners and specifically on uh, Spanish in the health service in the uh, United States. So it is obvious we are lucky uh, for having Glenn Martinez uh, among us today and I hope you enjoy very much this seminar. So please join me to welcome Glenn Martinez. Uh, one more time in this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paco. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to just uh, kind of give you an overview of what uh, we intend to do this morning. So I'm going to focus on uh, various aspects of language and healthcare policy. And uh, I'm going to review some of the research that I've done on, on language and healthcare policy. We are going to reflect on this policy through narratives of Spanish speakers in the health in the healthcare setting and finally I want to take this reflection and see how we can guide it and shape it towards uh, pedagogy towards teaching right so how do we how do we impact and affect the health workforce to improve outcomes and quality for uh, Spanish speaking patients so as I said, my aim in this talk is to provide you with a synthesis of my own research on Spanish in the U.S. health delivery system. And through this synthesis, I hope to share with you my own reflection on policy as well as my vision for future research in this field. 
Now, I have to admit that I'm a sociolinguist by training, right? And as a sociolinguist, my interest and my perspective has been on language policies in healthcare. Language policy. So, how are these language policies perform, performed? How are they perceived? And how do they impact Spanish speakers? I recognize at the same time, however, that language policy in healthcare really is nothing more than health policy. Language policy is health policy. In as much as its main goal is to modulate the distribution and adjust the delivery of care for the purpose of improving health outcomes in patients and in populations. So this recognition that what, I'm, what I have in view in studying language and healthcare policies is about more than language, is about speakers, really, I think, uh, does more than simply direct and orient my approach to the study of language policy and healthcare, but it also and more fundamentally shapes my identity as a sociolinguist. Sociolinguistics, sociolinguistics is the study of the complex and multifaceted relationship between language and society, right? And uh, Ralph, Ralph Fassold pointed out many years ago that sociolinguistic research and methodology may be oriented towards what he called the sociolinguistics of language or a sociolinguistics of society. In my own thinking about language and society, I've been driven to a further kind of distinction between a sociolinguistics of society and a sociolinguistics of the speaker in society. To study language is really to study the speaker of the language, because without speakers, there is no language really of which to speak. So the study of language and healthcare in general, and the study of language policy in healthcare more specifically, is really a study of what I've called uh, previously language experience. It's a language experience. It is the study of experiences in around and through language, and the resulting implications of those experiences on human biology. So given this orientation towards language experience, I want to begin this talk by telling you the story of one such experience. And you'll see throughout the talk that, in fact, the uh, the experience and the story is going to be really at the heart of everything that we do. So let me tell you the story of Griselda Zamora. Griselda Zamora was a bright and gifted girl, daughter of two proud parents, Antonio and Ines Zamora. As the daughter of immigrant parents who spoke very little English, Griselda's giftedness was expressed not only in her academic performance in school, but also, as noted by Guadalupe Valdez in her book, Expanding Definitions of Giftedness, her giftedness was displayed in her daily efforts to help her parents navigate the complex and routine affairs of life in a society that does not speak nor accept their language. Griselda would accompany her parents to doctor's visits, she would translate letters from school and work into Spanish. She would answer the phone on her parents' behalf when uh, they received calls from bill collectors and social service agents, agencies. On March, March 13th, 1999, March 13th, 1999, Griselda came down with abdominal pain, nausea, loss of appetite, and cold sweats. Antonio and Ines, having exhausted all known home remedies and worried about their daughter's grave and deteriorating condition, rushed her to the emergency room at Mesa Lutheran Hospital. There, her condition was evaluated as gastritis, and she was promptly discharged without any treatment. 
Griselda's symptoms worsened over the next several days, and on March 16th, her parents took her back to Mesa Lutheran. By this time, Griselda's ability to speak was severely impaired. Doctors again diagnosed acute gastritis. Antonio and Ines used whatever English they could muster to communicate with the doctors since, Gris uh, since Griselda could no longer speak. The doctors prescribed medication and told the parents to see a doctor in three days or to return to the emergency room if new symptoms appeared. Antonio and Ines understood that they were to wait three days before returning. So on March 18th, exactly three days after the ER visit, Griselda was vomiting green lip liquid, was disoriented and had lost the ability to, to speak and walk on her own. Antonio and Ines rushed her back to the ER at Mesa Lutheran. Her condition was assessed and she was transported by emergency helicopter to Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Phoenix. Two hours later, Griselda died. She was 13 years old. The cause of death, a ruptured appendix. The case made national headlines back in 99 and was later, in fact, probed for the possibility of medical malpractice. For policymakers and health professionals, it really sounded an alarm for the need to address language issues in healthcare. Griselda's tragic, untimely, and preventable death really gave way to a series of policies designed to break down language barriers in healthcare and to make health healthcare accessible to all regardless of their proficiency in English. So what you see at the bottom there is a little timeline of uh, language and healthcare policy and I want to present a brief retrospect of this policy so you have an under understanding of what the field looks like. So on August 11th, uh, the year 2000, President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 13166 entitled Improving Access to Services for Persons with Limited English Proficiency. The executive action required that all federal agencies and organizations uh, receiving funding from federal agencies should develop plans to make services accessible to clients with limited English proficiency. So this was any uh, federal agency that directly provides services uh, and it was any institution or organization that received federal dollars in any way from grants, from reimbursements, from any other federal source, all were required to develop a plan to make services accessible to clients with limited English proficiency. Um, in 2001, under the leadership of then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalela, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services commissioned the Office of Minority Health to develop a set of standards for health organizations to comply with the executive action. Now, if you think about how much federal money goes into health care, you understand the, the need for specific guidelines for health care organizations. Health, health, uh, health care is funded by the federal government in numerous ways, Medicare and Medicaid being probably the most uh, significant, but also uh, uh, grants, block grants to federally qualified health centers for indigent care, for care for the uninsured, uh, also uh, funding for capital improvements of hos hospitals and healthcare facilities, uh, also grants for clinical research. So, I mean, the, 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 really the, the amount of funding going into healthcare from federal sources is, is, uh, is substantial. And if, in fact, an executive order would cut off funding, it would be, it would be a quite damaging to the health delivery system. So the then Secretary of Health and Human Services made this effort to provide guidelines and make it easier for organizations to comply. So this was back in 2001, and the result was the publication of what's known as the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services, also known as the CLASS Standards. 
The class standards served as a guideline for hospitals, clinics, and doctor's offices to make their services available to patients with limited English proficiency. It included recommendations and guidelines concerning the governance of the organization, uh, the inclusion of linguistic minorities in the workforce and the leadership of organizations. And more, spe more significantly, it set forth four language access mandates. And these are the language access mandates that occur within class. So class is actually 14 standards, and these are four of those 14 standards. Um, so standard number one is that health healthcare organizations are to offer and provide language assistance services, including bilingual staff and interpreter services, at no cost to each patient consumer with limited English proficiency at all points of contact in a timely manner during all hours of operation. Second, that uh, healthcare organizations are to provide patients and consumers in their preferred language both verbal offers and written notices informing them of their right to receive language assistance services. The third, that they are to assure the competence of language assistance provided to limited English proficient patients and consumers by interpreters and bilingual staff. Family and friends should not be used to provide uh, interpretation services unless that is the wish and request of the patient. And finally, uh, the healthcare organizations are to make available easily understood patient related materials and post signage in the language of commonly encountered groups and groups represented in the service area. So the class language access mandates likely constitute the most explicit language legislation since the Lao remedies and the beginnings of federally mandated bilingual education. The mandates thus generated a significant amount of consternation among health organization administrators, especially given the fact that they are viewed as an unfunded mandate. Notice number one, at no cost to the patient, right? Now what in healthcare, anyone who's been to the hospital or doctor's office recently, what doesn't cost anything? They bill you for everything. <laughs> what does a Tylenol cost in a hospital? It costs like 50 bucks. You know, so that this, 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 uh, this notion of no cost to the patient, I think, really elevated the concern and consternation of healthcare administrators, together with the growing linguistic diversity. So does it mean that they need to have language assistance available in every single language that is spoken or will be spoken or possibly could be spoken in their service region, right? So this was the, this was the concern uh, by the health healthcare administrators. And the concerns were addressed not by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, but rather by the Department of Justice through a guidance statement provided by the Office of Civil Rights in 2005. So the Office of Civil Rights sought to quell the consternation of hospital administrators, healthcare systems, and I might add medical associations, so the AMA, the AHA, right, the American Medical Association, American Hospital Association, all came out and voiced opposition to uh, the class standards because of you know, the, the difficulty in actually complying. So uh, what OCR did, the Office of Civil Rights, they proposed what they called a four-factor analysis that would uh, specify the conditions under which compliance with the mandates would be required, right? So we have these four language access mandates, but we apply these language access mandates based on a four-factor analysis. And these are the Department of Justice guidelines. So they say recipients of federal financial assistance have an obligation to reduce language barriers that can preclude meaningful access by LEP persons to important benefits, rights, programs, information, and services. The starting point is an individual assessment that balances the following four factors. One, the number or proportion of LEP persons eligible to be served or likely to be encountered by the program or grantee recipient, right? So 
the number or proportion of LAP persons eligible to be served are likely to be encountered, right? If you are, you have a hospital in a place that receives very few uh, speakers of other languages, then you have no reason to comply, right? Um, no responsibility to comply. The frequency with which LEP individuals come in contact with the program, so you may be in Los Angeles, but you have no contact with Spanish speakers, right? So in that case, you would not have to uh, comply or your, your, your responsibility to comply would be lessened. The nature and importance of the program activity or service provided by the program to people's lives, right? So if you are an urgent care or emergency room, you're more responsible to comply. If you're a vein clinic or you know, a plastic surgery clinic, then you have less responsibility, right? So what is the importance of the service to people's lives? And finally, the resources available to the grantee, recipient, and cost. So if you have the money to do it, good. If you don't, then you don't have to, right? So what's, what's the effect of the Department of Justice guidance? I think the, the Department of Justice guidance really took the teeth out of the language access mandates, right? In as much as it restricted language access compliance to the largest organizations providing the most essential of services. Really, it put language access, it, it limited it and, and contained it within hospital services, right? Uh, in, in metropolitan areas, in areas with larger numbers of, uh, of uh, non-English speaking uh, patients. So that was 2005, and we're gonna fast forward now to 2010. In 2010, the Joint Commission, uh, the Joint Commission is the accreditation agency for hospitals uh, and many larger clinics, at least multi-physician multi uh, clinics and offices normally will seek Joint Commission accreditation. And Joint Commission accreditation is what determines, is what tells the public and assures the public that your hospital or clinic is safe, right, and meets safety uh, standards, and that the hospital or clinic provides quality services. So the Joint Commission added accreditation requirements in 2010 that mirrored the language of the class mandates within its focus on patient safety and quality of care, right? What this means is that Joint Commission accredited hospitals and clinics that do not follow the language access mandates may in fact lose their accreditation. And this then becomes, it puts the teeth back into the language access mandates. People are very worried about you know, a hospital administrator is very worried about losing accreditation. You know, just like a university is very worried about losing accreditation, right? So accreditation really is, is a, it's a voluntary process, but it's a process that demonstrates to the public that, uh, that your, your organization is a safe and a high quality organization. And the enforcement of these accreditation re requirements, therefore, once again, elevated concern over language access within uh, Joint Commission accredited organizations. It really became more, um, more of a concern because of the way that accreditation works. So a hospital is accredited using two different means or methodologies, right? So survey methodology is where the surveyors, accreditors, will go to the hospital, look at the policy manual, look at the procedures, um, ask questions of administrators and, uh, and, um, and uh, health personnel. And tracer methodology is another method that accreditors use in which they'll basically ask for a random sample of charts from the from the organization's uh, patient population. They'll take these charts 
and they'll look at every single interaction of the patient with the healthcare organization to see if that interaction met accreditation standards, right? So uh, Juan Sanchez is admitted to the hospital, sees nurse uh, Betty Molina, and the surveyor will ask, well, did Betty Molina have her vaccine shots? Yes. Where are they? Show me the, show me the proof, right? And what happens then is that tracer methodology opens up the, all of these interactions and accreditors now can ask, right? Well, so patient Juan Sanchez saw nurse Mary Floyd. Does Mary Floyd speak Spanish? Because Juan Sanchez says his preferred language is Spanish. And if Mary Floyd doesn't speak Spanish, then was there interpreter? Where's the... Where is the documentation that an interpreter was called, right? So the, the, um, the likelihood of being dinged on these, on these requirements is very, very high. And in fact, we have seen uh, more and more um, cases in which uh, hospitals are, are being cited for violating this or not meeting this accreditation standard, right? Uh, as as soon as they came into, uh, they came into they came to be enforced. So, uh, I, I think that the Joint Commission really played an important part in the enforcement of these language access mandates. In 2013, the Office of Minority Health uh, launched the Enhanced Class Standards. And with the enhanced class standards, they reaffirmed the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services commitment to language access and more explicitly connected language access to effective communication within the health delivery system. Okay, so that is my uh, short retrospect on policy. Any questions or comments as far? This could be as interactive as you want it to be, so you can just stop me, and, mm. right? If you if you have any questions. Well, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. Like one of the issues that I notice in some of the hospitals here is they just have like a red telephone. Yeah. Uh, so they mm -hmm. don't even have personnel. They're outsourcing. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's very common. That's very common. Um, so telephonic interpreting, video interpreting. There's a system called Marty. Uh, that's very common in Ohio. It's basically a cart like this with a computer. Someone connected to the other side, and you cart it into the hot, into the room, and you got a, a talking head here, and you'll they'll do the the interpretation, right? Uh, so, yeah. I have one more question. I understand now you put the standards here, but my understanding discussing with people at Bay State is that in theory there should be this bilingual interaction at any point from the reception desk to, and obviously they're not doing that. Yeah, they're not doing that. They're not, no. Um, we're going to talk about that in terms of the, the kind of research that I've been doing on policy implementation, right? Okay, but uh, yeah, you're certainly right that, and you know, providing patients uh, verbal offers and written notices not very likely, right? Uh, so, I mean, that, that, that there, I think that there being, there's a tendency to be more compliant, but it's not full compliance. And the threat of losing federal funding, I don't think was ever a real threat, right? I don't think anyone would be, would be denied a reimbursement claim from Medicare or Medicaid because they didn't follow, you know, some standards. So. Um, yeah, okay, so anything else, Any other comments? One thing I forgot to do was to ask you to introduce yourselves to me, so Paco introduced me to you, but <laughs> I don't know who everyone is. I know Luis, because so, he, he was my professor at UMass, no, it's great to see you again. <laughs> um, but so why don't we go around and just tell us, tell us, uh, you know, what, what your name is and what your background is, uh, either in Spanish teaching or in, in healthcare and Spanish speakers in healthcare. 
So uh, let's start with this. Okay, I, as, we go, I <laughs> as we've been discussing over the phone, that's mm -hmm, the thing. Mm -hmm. we are implementing a Puma Summer certificate in Spanish for the health professions, mm -hmm. uh, working with the School of Nursing. So these brought me mm -hmm, to call mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. and we read some of your articles <laughs> in my class. I've been also teaching a class where we're working uh, with Holyoke Health, translating their web page materials and things mm -hmm. like this. Um, sometimes we do the translation, discuss that issue, and we talk about health disparities and then mm -hmm. Latinos mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Okay. So that's what brought me. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hi, Hi um, good morning. I'm Maria Luisa Parra. I'm a senior preceptor here at Harvard University. I'm in charge of the first year program Spanish and in charge of the Latino Spanish heritage for Latino students. I'm a psychologist by training and a linguist, and I've worked with families sometimes, and uh, I think that this topic is really interesting. And also, a lot of my students, Latino students, are pre-med, and I really encourage them to you know, use that, keep that Spanish alive. Mm -hmm. um, it's exactly because of the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's Thank you. Yeah. My name is Mar, Maria del Mar. I'm a Spanish teacher here in Boston College in Harvard University, Maria Luisa, the Paradisa, sorry. Um, I'm interested in this topic because I was working, I was teaching a, a class, a Spanish for medical purpose in Spain, in Spain. And then uh, I would like to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm Francisco Jacobi, I'm with the Mexican Council, I'm the Council for Community Affairs and Protection. Hi Eva, I, I came here two years uh, ago, two years and a half, and I was working in Spain as a translator, and I wanted to work also as an interpreter, mm -hmm. so I don't know, some changes happened in my life, and now I'm here, and I'm working as a, a medical Spanish interpreter at Bethlehem Hospital since August, so I'm pretty sure. new in this field, sure. but it's very really interesting for me to see because mm -hmm. we have studied this in order to have the a medical yes, certificate, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's good to refresh on that, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and it's good also to have your, mm -hmm. your view. And mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty new, but if okay. I can also make a comment something later, okay. great. No. Great. Thank you. my name is Elena Carrion. I also teach at Boston College with Mar. Spanish. Um, I'm a translator by training, mm -hmm. but I haven't had the chance to get into this field. Mm -hmm. okay. I think be very interesting. Okay. Hi, my name is Pia Cuneo. My background is in law. So that interests me a lot, all the policies. Mm -hmm. And I'm now teaching uh, Spanish at Boston College and Simmons College mm -hmm. with Mark and Elena. Mm -hmm. right? And many of my students too at Simmons, uh, they are interested in nursing medicine, sometimes a BC medicine too, mm -hmm. so I think this would be very helpful mm -hmm. for me, Great. right? Great. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Lucia Reyes, I teach at Brandeis University, and I teach uh, two classes of Spanish for creative speakers and Spanish for medical professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small university, it, uh, it has a pre-med pr uh, program, so many students take Spanish for medical mm -hmm. professions, mm -hmm. thinking about yeah. Good. Good. Good morning, my name is Cameron Bebu, and today is informational for me because my colleague <laughs> um, invited me or sent me the mm -hmm. um, information, so I'm here to learn. So I don't have a whole lot to say because okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome. You know, my name is Paz Carrasco. I work in clinical research in Kento, mm -hmm. we're in the pharma industry, and I'm from Spain. And I'm very interested and I'm amazed how the, the people are working here to maintain Spanish. Mm -hmm. And my, my husband is from Austria. I've been living four years in Austria and for me it was very difficult to deal mm -hmm. with German. Mm -hmm. And here I just re registered with my family doctor last uh, week. And it was amazing how everything is in Spanish, English, they asked me, do you prefer to mm -hmm. fill the form mm -hmm. in Spanish, mm -hmm. do you prefer in English? And mm -hmm. So I think that is a great uh, effort and mm -hmm. service. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Uh, let's go back. Hi, my name is Tamara. I'm from Spain. 
I'm a healthcare professional, I'm a pharmacist, and I'm certifying my degree to work as a pharmacist here. Mm -hmm. I've been working at Brigham's Hospital for mm -hmm. the past two years in a specialized clinic, and I was in charge of the Spanish population patients sometimes when I had to cover the person in charge of that. And I noticed that a huge uh, misinformation and, and a gap there with a lot of patients. They don't really know uh, what's their problem, what's the medication for, and I, I worked with them and I explained and they were very appreciative of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw the, the lack of these uh, professionals, bilingual professionals, to try to yeah. get them understand what they, what they mm -hmm. have. So I'm very mm -hmm. interested in this topic and I want to work on that in the future. Great. Great, and he's my husband. He's in the process of learning Spanish. Okay. okay. <laughs> he came with me just to to get more information about it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Susana Castillo Rodriguez. I'm a teacher at sociolinguistics, Saint uh, College in, in New Hampshire, uh -huh. and um, um, there we have a really a solid program in nursing and then next year we are going to start with a minor in nursing and Spanish. Great. So this is why I'm mm -hmm. very interested yeah. in, in this program. And, um, my experience is in the healthcare and migration in Spain. Mm -hmm. and, um, but um, yeah, I'm here to learn more. Okay. <laughs> Great. Welcome. My name is Estefanía Bradejo. Yeah, I'm teaching also at Boston College and Emerson. I've been here for years now. Um, my background is more in linguistics and literature, but I'm interested in this field. I don't have any background in the medical okay. studies, but um, I think it's very interesting the way the service, the, mm -hmm. the application you can do with language, how you can mm -hmm. help people. Yeah. So I'm interested in knowing more about the system. Okay. Yeah. So, hello, my name is Sigue Pazo. I'm a nurse by training. But I'm uh, currently a student of a program in transnational cultural and community studies. Okay. And I'm also working in a, I mean, a project funded by the OMEH. Mm -hmm. And my, we're working, uh, trying to help the pockets of Latinos in Massachusetts that are underinsured or uninsured. Okay. So we provide the linguistic and cultural capacity for them to, mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to obtain the uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, the Affordable Care Act exactly. insurance. Good, great. Great. Okay. Well, good. So let's continue on then with uh, a little bit on the research side. So research on language policy and healthcare. So the background that I just gave you, I hope, will be uh, sort of an orientation to uh, this synthesis and reflection of my own uh, research on language policy and healthcare. Uh, the majority of which takes place in the border region right, between uh, Texas and Mexico, Arizona, Mexico border. Um, and I want to summarize some of the major findings in my work and bring to the fore some of the lingering questions that it's generated. And what we'll be doing is, as I present uh, these, these uh, ideas and findings, I'm going to try to generalize a bit, and then I'm going to show you a story. Right, So there will be another story and then I want you to reflect on that story to see how we can bring these, these findings and generalizations um, into greater clarity and focus through people's experiences. Right, So in looking at language and healthcare policy, I've had a great interest in the ideologies of language present in the formulation of policies. So how do policymakers and the practitioners that implement these policies conceive of language and talk about it? What is language for you know, someone in the health professions who's reading these language access mandates? How are they conceiving of language? How are they uh, thinking about it? How are they talking about it? Um, and this question, I think, increases in importance when we recognize that languages, conceptions of languageness, and meta-languages used to talk about language, uh, following uh, Simfrey McConey and Alastair Pennycook, are really inventions rooted in colonial and nationalistic projects in different parts of the globe. Right? I mean, what is what is 
a language. Is Spanish bounded to the countries where it's adopted as official, or is, is the language more flexible and fluid than that? Um, why is one particular language associated with one particular geopolitical unit? How did that come about? Was that some miraculous project, or was it, did it have to do with interests and with power and with the ways that geopolitical um, uh, divisions are made and the reasons that they're made and sustained. So this is uh, Simfrey McConey and Alistair Pennycook's argument in their book called uh, Reinve uh, Reinventing uh, Languages. Um, so this inventedness, I would argue, contributes to a salient disjoint in the discourse of health policy where language assistance is divorced and disembedded from language acceptance. Okay, so let's, let's uh, kind of unpack this disjuncture between language assistance and language acceptance. I think the, the disjuncture is evident in the viewpoint of language assistance as an overtaxing burden, as an unfunded mandate that really led to the Department of Justice formulation, um, as well as in the formulation itself as it reduces language assistance to only the most emergent cases within the largest and most well financially resourced organizations within the system. I think the disjunction and the difference between language assistance and language acceptance is also evident in the abjection felt by Antonio and Ines Zamora when they lost their daughter to a highly preventable and curable condition. And it continues to be evident as Spanish speakers encounter hostile reactions to their presence in the health delivery system. I remember in Natalie Kelly's uh, Narrative Matters piece in Health Policy, uh, she's a telephone interpreter, and she recalled in that piece uh, when a physician told the patient that she was interpreting for over the phone, next time you come in, you habla ingles, comprende? So what is the underlying conception of language that drives this wedge between language assistance and language acceptance. In order to get at this question, I conducted a discourse analysis of three foundational documents in uh, language and healthcare policy published by the US Department of Health and Human Services. And my intent in doing that discourse analysis was to uncover the particular conception of language and languageness emerging in health policy discourse. Uh, the analysis revealed two important facets of the invention of language in health policy discourse. First, I found that language was viewed as an autonomous system, this neutral tool uh, used for the accurate and objective transmission or telementation of ideas. And this, of course, is a concept of language that uh, Bauman and Briggs have argued was really a key contour in the voice of modernity. It's a key construct in, in uh, the construction of modernity. This view of language as neutral, as autonomous, as disembedded and, and taken away from its, outside of its speakers. So we see this autonomous view of language uh, in these policy documents in statements such as, language is, is as important a diagnostic tool or more so than any blood test or x-ray, right? So language then becomes a tool, a medical instrument, right? And as a medical instrument, it is open to regimes of surveillance and control that would be applied to any other medical instrument. You know, you have an x-ray machine, you have it checked on a three-month schedule, right? You have the technician come and check it out and make sure that it's okay and working fine. Well, the same thing happens with language as it's viewed as a tool, as an instrument, right? So it needs to be controlled, it needs to be surveilled, it needs to be measured, and so forth. Uh, so this uh, surveillance and control, 
I think was also evident in the documents analyzed. So notice the second quote that I have here. The hospital had no control over the quality or content of the instructions that patients received. Uh, the recommendation is that bilingual cl clinicians and other staff who communicate directly with patients in their preferred language must demonstrate command of both English and the target language. So there's this autonomous view of language that then leads to uh, these notions of surveillance and control of the language, right, in order to ensure that the instrument is functioning appropriately, okay? So that's one view uh, of language that's, that seems to be implicit in the policy and that I think uh, contributes to this distinction between assistance and acceptance. So what, what do you understand? How is the autonomous view of language connected to this distinction between assistance, language assistance and language acceptance? <laughs> One question for me, and I do not know how it works, but how are those certifications handled? Is there like a standardized exam mm -hmm. to be qualified, and what is the language you there? Yeah. Like yeah. so many of my bilingual students who come to you mass and place into Spanish 200, mm -hmm. even if they're fluent in the language. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have that kind of problem in the certification of medical interpreters? I think we do. I think we do. Um, and I, I, there's actually a study that I'm going to talk about in just a second about how that, how that works. So, yeah, I think that the, the same standard language ideologies, the same preferences for certain types of language, more written types of languages, and in fact, some of the, some of the exams actually include a written portion in Spanish before you can even qualify to take the oral portion, right? So you have to know how to put your acentos if you're going to serve patients in the hospital. Why do you have to know where the acentos go? <laughs> you know, why is that Why is that a criterion for serving pen patients? Yeah, and I'm thinking about, thinking about the work that you've done with um, the importance of dialects and environment, mm -hmm. the disconnect between, even when they are trained mm -hmm. in Spanish, that Spanish, what you're saying, is probably so standard that the disconnect between what they know and what the patients mm -hmm. bring from different countries, from Latin America, the different registers, the different vocabulary, mm -hmm. it must be very hard to connect. Yeah. There's, there's no connection. There. Exactly. There's no awareness. Yeah. There's no validation of the other information that mm -hmm. patients are bringing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Any other comments on the autonomous view and assistance and acceptance? Without wanting to follow as teachers at the university, when we first started thinking of teaching medical Spanish, we thought, okay, we're going to teach advanced grammar with medical lexicon. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's all you need. You need to know these specific words. Mm -hmm. And you've done it. And yeah, there are yeah. many, and I think like in one of your articles, you do talk about in those interpreting moments that mm -hmm. they might be very fluent in the technical vocabulary, yeah, that yeah. they cannot have like mm -hmm. intimate conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that the assistance view, the view of language assistance, is the idea that communication is happening. Right, that we are we are providing a way to stand in and make communication that otherwise wouldn't happen happen. Right, the view of language acceptance I think goes beyond communication and refers to identification, to rapport, to empathy. Right, not simple linguistic lexical communication, meaning transfer, but rather a more broader type of intersubjectivity, right, a more broader type of 
relationship and rapport occurring between the two people. So that's kind of the difference I see between assistance and acceptance. And I think that this autonomous view of language, disembedding language from its speaker, disembedding it from its identity functions, disembedding it from its, uh, its, its social meanings and the social meanings that it convey conveys, I think then really positions language to be simply a tool for assistance and not right the the bridge for for acceptance okay yeah the language is not just a um, assistant it's sure. a it's sure. a cultural product yeah. so yeah. there is some language which is not accepted mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can know bring this, this thing to a person, you cannot ask these type of questions, you know, in, in this particular context, mm -hmm. or you have, to, you have to play around and in order to ask this question mm -hmm. and bringing another vocabulary, another type of questions, so it's just not mm -hmm. just the language, it's yeah. the social the yeah. identification, it's just mm -hmm. like a, the environment is yeah. allows you to put a mm -hmm. question of another. Yeah. You know, if you are telling, particularly, I, I work a lot with um, um, uh, sexual and maternity health mm -hmm. problems, mm -hmm. so asking these type of questions are very yeah. sensitive. Yeah. So you have to know the culture in mm -hmm. order to know from which point of you know, mm -hmm. you yeah. The yeah. Yeah. And that that's where I think that acceptance, language acceptance is really constructed through those cultural I, I wouldn't I would I would go beyond products and I would say practices too, right? Mm -hmm. And really language is just a resource, right? La language in its many different variety, shape, standard, non standards are all just resources that we use to 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 implement and and realize those cultural practices, right? Yeah. So you know, some of my work with uh, with heritage learners in medical Spanish has looked at, okay, well, how do non-standard forms, right, just the forms that you know would be marked with an X in red in a in a Spanish classroom, are actually useful to them in clinical functions, right? So you do say Traiba and Aiga and you know <laughs> and El Bile and those kinds of things. That's that's what you use to create this this construction. So really, what you know this this acceptance and identification with patients. So really, you know, to have the a medical professional who has at his or her disposal all of the resources of language, right? The different the different you know levels and and. Uh, and registers of language is actually more successful at do at effectuating this cultural practice than you know the, the one who's just trained in academic discourse with lexicon and medical lexicon and advanced grammar, right? Yeah. Um, so the second. <coughs> uh, uh, idea that I pulled from these documents, and it also related to the autonomous view of language uh, and the related desire for language surveillance and control, was a manifestation of a geopolitical view of language, a geopolitical view of language that deterritorialized languages other than English, specifically Spanish. By naturalizing the geopolitical belonging of English and the non-belonging of Spanish and other languages, the discourse of health policy effectively neutralizes any contribution of U.S. Spanish speakers to meet the language challenges, to meet language challenges in healthcare. For example, uh, one, one of the policy documents argues that, and this is up on the screen, bilingual individuals, unless they were trained as health professionals in another country, generally only have skills in the target language, right? So, you know, these, this idea of conversational skills that are not sufficient, that in order to be, to truly meet the language barrier issue, you need to be trained as a nurse or as a physician somewhere else, right? So why, why 
construct languages that are not English as not belonging in the US. We have many native speakers of Spanish in the US, right, who can perfectly well and perfectly uh, uh, provide these services. So I think that the autonomous view of language and this deterritorialization of Spanish really piece together a portrait of the invention of language in health policy. Now, what I want to do is show you another story. This is Marisol's story. Um, and get you to think about how acceptance, right, this notion of language acceptance is either uh, realized or not realized in the story, and then what could have been done differently to realize language acceptance, to, to provide this connection between Marisol and the health uh, system. And think about these constructs of language, right? Language as autonomous, language as deterritorialized, as not belonging. And what, what does, what, what attaches to language? So when you deterritorialize Spanish and you say Spanish doesn't belong, well, what else doesn't belong with Spanish? So you, you deterritorialize and you you, you uh, construct Spanish as not belonging, but together with Spanish, you are, you are taking its speakers, you're taking, you know, you're taking all kinds of other things, right, together with it. Uh, so let, let's watch this, uh, this narrative. And let me tell you a little bit about the background of these stories that you're gonna be uh, listening to throughout the morning. Uh, so these are digital, uh, illness narratives created by students in a medical Spanish class. Uh, students, the class was called Sociolinguistics and Latino Health. And the final project of the class was for students to identify a, uh, a family member or friend or some, some individual in the community that had experienced language difficulties in healthcare. I taught this class for probably about four years. I taught it every semester. I had in total probably 300 students uh, in that class. And never once, not once, did a student ever come up to me and say, Profe, I just don't, I can't find anyone. I don't know anyone who's had a language issue in healthcare. Never once. You know, every student had a story. Every one of them. You know, every one of them could immediately identify someone who had experienced uh, language rejection or language uh, tensions and conflict within the health delivery system. So this is one of those uh, stories. Mi nombre es Marisol Longoria. Soy divorciada y tengo tres hijos a los cuales he mantenido yo sola. Gracias a Dios, ya encontré a alguien que me hace feliz. Desde pequeña fui muy atlética. Siempre estuve en deportes en la escuela, en baile, e incluso también fui porrista. Durante el transcurso de los años aún seguía haciendo ejercicio diariamente. Todo cambió el día que sufrí un terrible accidente. Caminando por una tienda, Tropecé porque aparentemente acababan de trapear y el piso estaba mojado. Caí de espalda y también sufrí un fuerte golpe en la cabeza. Se me era imposible levantarme. Mi hija, asustada de que tuviera daño cerebral, me llevó al hospital. Yo estaba en un dolor insoportable y estaba completamente doblada en dos e increíblemente hinchada. Al llegar al hospital y ver que no tenía seguro y que además tenía un acento al hablar el inglés, me hicieron esperar más de seis horas antes de que me viera un médico. En cuanto me vio el doctor, puso una cara de susto y me mandó a que me tomaran radiografías. Después de verlas, no me dijo exactamente qué era lo que sucedía. Simplemente me dijo que la cirugía costaba más de 100 mil dólares y que yo no tenía seguro ni dinero para pagarlo. Yo seguía muy mala y decidí ir a ver a mi médico en Reynosa. 
Al ver mis estudios, el doctor me dijo que me había roto una vértebra que por algún milagro no había tocado mi espina dorsal y estaba asombrado de que me hubieran dejado ir del hospital en esas condiciones. Me dijo que la mayoría de la gente en mi condición queda paralítica al instante y no tenía idea de cómo yo seguía caminando. Me dijo que tuviera demasiado cuidado, que porque con cualquier movimiento brusco yo podía quedar paralítica. Para ese entonces yo ya había entrado en pánico. Regresé con el doctor americano y le llevé mis estudios de México. Incluso después de todo eso, como quiera, se rehusó a operarme y me mandó a una clínica que según él daba ayuda a gente sin seguro en Corpus Christi. Le dije que el dolor era insoportable y ya no podía esperar más, casi casi suplicándole que me atendiera. Me mandó a hacer una faja para la espalda y me dio grandes cantidades de morfina y relajantes musculares muy fuertes. Gracias a Dios, hoy casi un año después ya estoy mucho mejor. No necesité cirugía y voy mejorando con el paso del tiempo. Los doctores dicen que fue porque nunca perdí la fe ni las ganas de vivir y seguí ejercitándome. La verdad, esta experiencia no se la deseo a nadie. El sufrimiento y sentimiento de rechazo al no saber ni siquiera exactamente qué pasaba con mi cuerpo fue lo peor de todo. Y aunque los medicamentos que me recetaron me ayudaron a dormir y me disminuyeron casi todo el dolor, me seguían llenando la receta con tal de no lidiar conmigo y no me explicaron cuándo ni hasta cuándo tomarlas. Solo me dijeron que cuando sintiera dolor. Desafortunadamente me volví adicta a ellas y batallé mucho para dejarlas de usar. Sufrí de cantidades de síndromes de abstinencia hasta que por fin logré dejarlas. Aún lloro cada vez que me acuerdo y no dejo de pensar que mi dolor y tiempo de recuperación hubiera sido mucho menos si los doctores me hubiesen tratado con más compasión o si hubiese sido un doctor mexicano que hablara español. Okay. Okay. Uh, entonces, there you have uh, Marisol's story. How is the narrator's perception of language tied to the outcome of this experience right how does she how does she interpret the her her language barrier as connected to to negative aspects of this experience. So you'll see, you know, all of the common complaints about the healthcare system are in this story, right? Wait times, financial barriers, um, you know, over medication, right? Addiction, right? All of the all of the components, right? And complaints about uh, about the healthcare system are present there. And that could lead some people to say, oh, well, language is not even a problem, right? It's, it's other things. It's, let's address the financial issue. Let's address the wait times. Let's, let's address uh, medication and pharmaceuticals, right? Language isn't even important. However, if you look at that, everything, all of these issues are viewed through the lens of language, right? I spoke English with an accent and I waited six hours. <laughs> Right? So notice how that how they they're they're both they're they're connected, right? And they're linked together. So what what would have made that um and then notice also the the shift to so where does correct diagnosis happen? Right? You have to cross a geopolitical border boundary for that to happen, right? And then she goes, she goes to Reynosa, to Mexico, finds out the cause and then goes back to But get the surgery. She cannot be treated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know if they didn't have the, the, the surgery was not available or, you know, it could be that in order to get that level of treatment within the Mexican system, you have to be within ISTE or, or the Seguro Social or something, right? 
Um, and the only way to get into that is to be employed in Mexico, right? So if you are, if you're employed in the U.S., then you can't be part of the EAMS or the ESTED, right? So, I mean, though, that, that could po possibly be a reason. Um, but, but it's interesting that medical knowledge is obtained, right? I mean, the, the, the circuit of knowledge is going past the, board, the geopolitical boundary and then bringing it back. And the doctor couldn't speak with her in the U.S. Like he mm -hmm. looked at the X-rays and said nothing, or yeah, didn't give yeah. Or there, was no, there was no, there was no instruction. There was no, you know, instead of saying, "This is the problem," this is the this is the diagnosis, you know, the report is, or the you know, the the, the patient's perception is. He told me, "It's a hundred thousand dollars, and you don't have it. So, figure it out, right?" Uh, Okay, and that is linked then to to the to the language issue, right? So, what could have been done to promote greater language acceptance? Would an interpreter have changed it? I don't know if we have some interpreters here. Yeah. Okay. It's the only way I can think of. Because if there's no, even if they have people who speak Spanish there, maybe uh, some medical assistant. Sometimes they don't have the, the knowledge, so they don't know. They can help. But the best way is to have a medical interpreter. Mm -hmm. But as you said, uh, not all places can afford that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, big hospitals they can face to face or over the phone. Mm -hmm. They always know how to how to find help in these mm -hmm. cases. But I don't know which kind of hospital or mm -hmm. is there. Yeah, uh, it was a hospital in the, on the border region, so most of its clients were Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. One thing that's interesting here is that the, the narrator is not attributing the, the tension and conflict with the system as just not understanding the message, mm -hmm. right? It's... The, the conflict and tension arises from understanding the message and understanding more than the message, right? The social meaning behind that message. So the, this, this idea of the accent, right? And I spoke English with an accent and that indexed me as unable to pay, right? So, you know, and that led to greater wait time, six hours waiting in the emergency room. That led to over medication that led to being sent to indigent care in Corpus Christi that led to you know all of the issues within and in this regard with that antagonistic relationship with the mm -hmm. doctor mm -hmm. the interpreter would make not much of a difference I think mm -hmm. the interpreter mm -hmm. would be in the middle of this antagonistic yeah. relationship. I think the, yeah. the, the doctor didn't care and he didn't want to spend a minute more than what he had to. Yep. She had no money to pay. Yeah. She had an accent mm -hmm. and he didn't care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he would have cared, he would have probably found someone, a nurse, someone that could come in for two minutes mm -hmm. and explain. He didn't want to waste money. I mean, time. Time, time is money. money. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another yeah. thing that I see is that um, mm. well, Spanish patients, but they support Chinese patients, they don't complain. Because they don't know how to complain, and yeah. so also they can yeah. take advantage. If you have someone American, they can complain. I've been waiting here for one, two hours, and they can express the Spanish is gonna be there, sitting in a corner, six hours waiting without saying anything, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they know. So what? Well, not. Well, yeah, not. Yeah. yeah. He can wait more than the others, so mm -hmm. he can stay mm -hmm. here. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, it is clear that the doctor was not really mm -hmm. up to help her mm -hmm. because she, he, I mean, she's saying that he was concerned when he saw the results, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also, I don't know this, but I'm asking if the third party the interpreted also plays, you know, puts pressure on the doctor's side to be more accountable for what he's doing and not having that third party there allows sometimes doctors to be able to do exactly this. I mean, can a doctor have done that? 
with a third party there? Like what like, kind of yeah. a third party? What, what, what yeah. those alliances are? Yeah. I don't know, but I think it's also... Yeah, so, so if you look at, at some of the research on, on interpreters, what you'll find is the alliance is, in fact, with the provider, right? So they're used as gatekeepers, they're used as mm -hmm. co-diagnosticians, right? Interpreters fill these other institutional functions and not, uh, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, really the, the whole the whole notion of patient advocacy is really, you know, within certification and training and those, those kinds of things, it's really, it's really um, not not encouraged. I mean, it is encouraged, but the parameters mm -hmm. <laughs> to advocate for patients are very very limited. Right. Yeah, well, if it, had yeah. made, if it would have made any difference, if the hospital and the physician, the doctor would know that this has happened in a commercial establishment, would there probably be exactly. an insurance. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. get the hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah. so. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think that there is certainly much more than language going on here. However, it's interesting to see how through the lens of language you can pull all these things together. It's kind of like language seeps into all these crevices, right? Financial and insurance and legal and, you know, all of these different crevices that language kind of holds them together. And the way that the patient is interpreting that experience through language, right? Is is interesting. It's, uh, it's yeah. Well, to make a difference, that they got there to the hospital. That she failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she failed at at Walmart. At Walmart. Yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, th there's no shortage of ambulance chasers in in the the Rio Grande Valley. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's go on to the next area of research, and then we'll take a break after this uh, this session. Like at 11.30, a little, yes. little bit after 11.30, we'll take a little break. Okay, so the second line of questioning uh, in my research on language policy and healthcare then deals with patient perceptions of policy implementation, right? So how do patients view this policy, right? How do they interpret it? So on the one hand, I've explored ways in which local interaction patterns shape the clinical encounters experienced by Spanish speakers in the health delivery system. And on the other hand, I've considered the implicit messages that are conveyed through the use of Spanish language uh, on signs and written materials in healthcare facilities. So two aspects. And we'll just look at the first aspect now, the local interaction pattern. So turning first to this analysis of local interaction patterns, I argue that policy implementation always occurs within local practices of communication and interaction. So local practices, I argue, can override and reduce the very communicative efficiency that policies are meant to produce. Um, Local interaction patterns I view as these uh, durable and pervasive ways of interacting that reflect and sustain the local linguistic order. And the idea of a local linguistic order, I follow Bonnie Urcioli in defining it as the bounded spheres of relations that license and legitimate language use in a bilingual environment. So I found two specific local interaction patterns that appeared to shape patient perceptions of the encounter. The first is what I called the performative elevation of English. And by the way, uh, if you look at these slides here, they have the references to the, to the articles that I'm talking about. Um, so there's one and the other. Okay. Um, and we, we can make the, the slides available. Right, Paco? We can make the slides available to them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first was what I call the performative elevation of English. And here I'm referring specifically to a pattern of language choice when initiating a conversation. So anyone who is bilingual, right? Any of us are bilingual. And every time we open our mouth, 
every time. We have to make a choice, right? Am I going to speak English or am I going to speak Spanish? How do you make that choice? How do you decide? What determines it? It could be environment, where you are. It could be what you're talking about. It could be who you're talking to, right? I mean, those are all factors in deciding language choice. What if it's not clear? What if the place where you are, you speak either English or Spanish? What you're talking about, you say it either in English or in Spanish, and the person you don't really know. So what's your default? Huh? English, right, as the default. And that's, this is what I'm talking about in terms of the performative elevation of English. The, the choice of English as a default is itself a performative, right? So um, in, in this study, I looked at this and this, this, uh, this one uh, default language choice, and I found that the absence of, uh, of these cues and the default interaction pattern in English was uh, talked about by the patients that, that I interviewed. So the first example on the screen illustrates the interaction pattern. So right there. De hecho, yo cuando voy me pongo en la ventanilla como siempre y me hablan en inglés. Yo les digo, discúlpame, pero no sé inglés. Right? So every time I go up to the window, right? Como siempre, as always. Every time I go up, may I help you? Right? And then the reply, discúlpame, pero no sé inglés. I view this interaction pattern then as a performative, a performative that constructs English as the natural, normal, and default medium of communication. At the same time, as a performative, I think it also reduces Spanish to a non-natural, abnormal medium of communication, right? So notice that within that interaction, there's always that need to say, disculpame. Disculpame, I'm sorry, but I don't speak English, right? And you have to, you have to, to, to state that each and every time the interaction happens. You know? So notice the durability, como siempre. Um, the subordinated position, me lo puede decir eh, en español, the subjugated and subordinated position that emerges of having to state every time. I don't speak English. I don't speak English. I don't speak English, right? And what is the impact of that as a performative, right? Um, so the next example on the screen illustrates how this pattern results not only in a subordinated positioning of the Spanish speaker, but also in lack of health information, right? So health information is kind of cut off because of this this same performative. So we asked a, a, a patient, cuando, cuando usted va a comprar las medicinas, usted pide las instrucciones en español? And the response, si sí, se las pedía en español, pero me las daban en inglés. So I asked in, in Spanish and I got them in English, right? So the, the health information is cut off as well. The second interaction pattern that I found is what I called the deliteracization of Spanish. And this is an interaction pattern in which literate language is assumed to be in English. Literate language is assumed to be in English. What's written is written in English, right? Written language is in English. And this is uh, uh, in the same way that English is performatively privileged as the default language in communication, in oral communication, it's also privileged as the dominant language of print environments. So healthcare providers would routinely refrain from providing any written materials, even in cases where this is the standard of care, like in post-operative discharge. Person is, is discharged after an operation and they're given this stack of papers, right? right? So the standard of care is to provide written information. However, even in these cases, they would either provide the, the materials in English without anything and just give them, right? Or provide an accompanying oral explanation. 
So these two options are illustrated in examples on the screen. E, and these are, these are both cases of, uh, of post-op uh, discharge. Y no le dio algún escrito pamfleto? No, no me dio nada. Nomás fue lo que me dijo ya. Right? So I, got, I received nothing after the, after the discharge. Y no pediste tú que, que te diera la información en español para lo de la rodilla? Se lo pedí, pero no lo tenían. Y por eso te la explicaba él en español, porque no lo tenían en español. Right? So it's this, this uh, switching to the oral medium, right? When written, written channels are required. And I call this kind of a deliteracization, right? So the, the, the proper place of Spanish is not written, but rather oral, right? Um, now... This deliteracization, I think, provides a fractured and non-reinforced transmission of health information that really places significant a priori constraints on the patient's ability to comply with physician indications, right? So we expect the good patient, right, to leave the hospital and follow instructions, right, and come back three weeks later and we'll see the, the results. But compliance in this environment is not the same, right? You weren't given the indications, right? And this, I think, harkens back to uh, Paul Farmer's analysis as of compliance as a behavior that is co-constructed between providers and patients. You know, there's a tendency to say, oh, well, this patient, these patients never comply, right? You give, them, you give them a prescription and they don't even fill it, right? And there's, you know, it, it's, it's constructed as something that the patient does. The patient can either comply or not. And Paul Farmer argues, well, it's really co-constructed. It's the patient, the, the, the physician and the provider has as much responsibility in compliance as does the patient, okay? So let's watch another story. This is Michelle's story. And in this story, I want you to think about this notion of compliance, right? This notion of being able to follow uh, directions and follow uh, health provider recommendations and the role of language therein. So this is Michelle's story. Mi nombre es Maricarmen González. Tengo tres hijos, dos niñas y un niño. Michelle, mi bebé, tiene 12 años de edad. Siempre ha sido una niña muy bonita. Desde chiquita, Michelle ha sido un poco extraña, pero a la edad de 7 años, las cosas empeoraron. Desde entonces, ha sido diagnosticada con esquizofrenia, autismo severo, retraso mental y epilepsia. Estos pasados años han sido muy difíciles. Soy madre soltera y es difícil mantener un trabajo fijo con todas las visitas al doctor que mi hija tiene. Fui a una escuela de cosmetología y tengo mi propio negocio en casa. No gano mucho, pero me permite atender a mi hija. Recuerdo la primera alucinación que Michelle tuvo. Ya era noche y ella empezó a gritar que tenía insectos encima de ella. Se empezó a quitar toda la ropa y después todavía se tallaba todo el cuerpo llorando que tenía insectos pero no había nada. Ahora toma medicamento para controlar las alucinaciones. Michelle pasa la mayoría del tiempo que está en la casa, en el pasillo y platicando con ella misma. Es muy difícil hacer conversación con ella. Quisiera poder ayudarla más, pero es difícil tratar con ese sistema en los Estados Unidos. Hablo muy poco inglés. Es difícil comunicarme con las maestras de mi hija. Tenemos juntas para discutir las necesidades educativas de Michelle. Me dan su palabra de que van a hacer lo posible para ayudarla. Nunca cumplen sus promesas. Siento que me ignoran la mayoría del tiempo. La escuela es solamente una guardería infantil. Mi hija tiene 12 años de edad y no sabe leer. No puede sumar ni rezar. Casi más oraciones completas. Es frustrante ver a mi hija la situación que está y no tener una voz en este sistema para ayudarla. Me siento igual de impotente con los doctores. Las enfermeras y secretarias son muy groseras. Parece que están frustradas porque no sé inglés y a veces se enojan porque llego un poco tarde a las citas. 
pero muchas de las veces tengo citas con varios doctores el mismo día. Y si un doctor atiende a Michelle tarde, llego con el otro doctor tarde. A veces es un poco difícil adherir con las órdenes de los doctores. Por ejemplo, la neuróloga de mi hija ordenó que Michelle tuviera ayuda de uno a uno en su escuela. Tuve que pelear con la escuela para que se dieran a darle ayuda de uno a uno. Hasta ahorita no lo han hecho. Las personas de la farmacia han sido de mucha ayuda. Michelle toma seis diferentes medicamentos todos los días. Los frascos con diferentes colores simplifican mucho las cosas. Cada día es una batalla constante para proveerle a mi hija ayuda. Creo que si supiera inglés, los doctores y las maestras me tomaran más en serio. Estoy yendo a la escuela para aprender inglés y ojalá podré ayudar a mi hija más cuando sepa inglés. During the class, we talked about compliance to doctor's orders. I'll be honest, I used to always blame the patient for not adhering to doctor's orders. But is it always the patient's fault? I see how hard my mother tries to adhere to the doctor's orders in order to help my sister. But as is often the case with non-English speakers, she is unable to receive the respect necessary to carry the orders out. Although many doctors subscribe to the blame the patient mentality, for some non-English speakers, it seems that some orders are just out of reach. Okay. So how does that story uh, illustrate the role of language and its connection to this issue of compliance? I mean, she summed it up really well at the end, right? I mean, she, she, uh, she's actually a physician. Actually, this person, <laughs> it's, uh, she, she, just finished, uh, she just finished medical school and now she's doing a residency in El Paso. Well, uh, but how, do, how does she sum up that? What are, the, what are the barriers that the mom is facing? <laughs> she's not facing Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she pointed out that the physicians or uh, when they receive the instructions, they are frustrated because they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen that, fr that frustration mm -hmm. uh, in the workplace. Um, they assume that they don't speak English and that they don't like it and mm -hmm. they make the effort to yeah. try to yeah. make it easier for them. So mm -hmm. that, that really annoys them, that mm -hmm. they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. it's that's the barrier. Yeah, yeah. The, the, these assumptions, right? Yeah. That you know, if you don't speak English, you must be lazy. Because my right. grandparent, my granddad, came here from Italy, and <laughs> you know. But you know, to you what extent can we say that this? You know, looking at the whole narrative, where's the laziness there? Yeah. What's lazy? What's lazy about you know going to to? Beauty school, create, putting a business in your house, t going to class and trying to learn English because, you know, that th there's nothing lazy <laughs> in that in that story anywhere, right? Yeah. But yet the assumption the is still there and constructed in that interaction, right? What else did you see in the story? I have to be saying the issue of class. Mm -hmm. And I imagine the rich Mexicans who travel from Mexico City to Houston to be treated, maybe they're not bilingual, and they're probably treated very well. Yeah, yeah. and they, they not only come from Mexico, but they come from Saudi Arabia and from United Arab Emirates. And, you know, there is a, there is a huge uh, push in hospitals to create these destination medicine, international patient, uh, kinds of kinds of uh, services, and they often link to the interpreter services. So at, at Ohio State, the, the the same person who is in the manager of interpretive services is also the director of destination medicine, right? Destination medicine, say so yeah, 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 yeah. To bring to and it, it's normally it's mostly in our cancer center, which you know has has excellent uh, 
cancer care. And they, they get patients from all over the world. But yeah, the availability of interpreters, right, the treatment, you know, these are cash paying customers and they roll out the red carpet, right, for, for them. I had a student who did a, uh, who did a study in Houston look, comparing the international patient language services in, I think, Methodist Hospital and the interpreter services in Ben Top, which is like the, the public hospital. Totally different. Totally different requirements for the interpreters. Totally different, uh, you know, workforce, you know, and ability coverage, right? <laughs> Day and night, right? And yeah, you know, so when, when there's money involved and when you can charge for it, then, you know, then it's there. And when, it's, when you can't, then it's, it's cut out. So yeah, class certainly is, is huge. Uh, I know that resources. I'm thinking I grew up in a family of doctors, mm -hmm. so um, I heard a lot of similar stories back in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and I wonder if all these issues are also magnified by, you know, that the hospitals also struggle so much in terms of the resources. I, I know that it's more than that, but I'm just thinking about how much that the, the whole system, it's so ill-designed to really provide some mm -hmm. of the people with the most need yeah. with, yeah. Most, with more resources. Mm -hmm. um, you could go to Mexico City and hear stories of these same mothers. The issue of language is not there, but the issue of class mm -hmm. is there. Um, and um, the disconnection between parents and teach and Mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. Parents mm -hmm. and doctors were yeah, well, yeah, the yeah, same. Yeah. I was thinking about that. My mother mm -hmm. worked many times. She's a family therapist. That she worked with um, for many years in a hospital, helping families with children with uh, dial um, mm -hmm. kidney issues yeah. to connect with the doctors, and it was impossible. Mm -hmm. So there are so many disconnections, even without the language, and there's mm -hmm. this lack of understanding of who the patient is. Mm -hmm that is sometimes missing in the training of medical. And when they have it, the system is so demanding mm -hmm. that they cannot really perform yeah. um, in that way. So it's a very you know, mm -hmm. intricate and complex. And certainly yeah. in this context, language and culture, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. just at the center. Of yeah, the yeah, yeah. No, I, what I found in my, you know, in my thinking and my research on language and healthcare. I don't, I don't think that if we suddenly created a system in which every non-English speaker received all of the care that they received, you know, in their own language, that it would solve all the problems. It wouldn't. But I think that language magnifies and, and shapes these the, the problems that already exist in very different ways, right? right? In very unique ways. Yeah. Uh, and, and the class yeah. issues, mm -hmm. here are lazy, but mm -hmm. they are ignorant. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can wait. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So yeah. um, even we have wonderful centers, of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let's continue. So I'm going to talk about another study that looks at um, patient perceptions of policy implementation. So going back, the language access mandate. So in this study, I'm really focusing on the, the fourth access mandate about signage and written materials and how what we call in, in, in sociolinguistics, we have the term linguistic landscape to talk about these visual manifestations of language. And that, that's kind of where this study is coming from. So um, in this study, what I wanted to do was to uncover reactions to signs and written materials that appeared in Spanish in healthcare facilities. And to do this, I... Um, recruited young bilinguals uh, between the ages of 17 and 20 who regularly accompanied their parents or grandparents to doctor's offices and clinics. And I used a particular methodology for this study called PhotoVoice. 
and photo voice is a methodology very common in public health and in health assessment kind of research. So basically what it is is you, you define a group of participants, you provide them with a camera, and you ask them to go out to whatever space is under, under study, and you ask them to take pictures of things. And they go around and, they, you know, if you're doing a health assessment, they might take pictures of mole in a stairwell. They might take pictures of garbage on the street. They might take pictures of, you know, all these different things. And once they collect the, the, the photos, they come back together and discuss critically why they took this photo, right? So why did you take this photo? What does it mean? What can we do? And that, that's kind of the photo voice methodology. So I try to apply this methodology with these young people and ask them, okay, go to the places where you normally accompany your parent or your grandparent to receive care and take pictures of any language that you see, you know, in, on signs, on, on pamphlets, in the waiting area, you know, and, and in different places within the, the, uh, the healthcare facility. And after that, we got back together and we reflected on the meaning of these pictures. So the youngsters in the studies amassed a total of about 150 photos, right? They took 150 photos. And then they met in small groups afterwards to discuss their reactions to the photos. And what they reported, I think, was generally a disbelief at this lack of materials available in Spanish. So, you know, they had never paid attention to it before, but when I asked them to go take pictures, well, where's the Spanish sign? I don't <laughs> <laughs> There's one in English, but where's the Spanish one? And that was kind of a disbelief, an eye-opener for them, um, that there was such little availability in Spanish compared to English. What they also pointed out was that most signs in Spanish tended to be about making payment and about hospital and clinic rules, right? So don't leave your children unattended. That would appear in Spanish. Or payment due at the time of service. That would be in Spanish, right? But, uh, you know, signs about or in posters about prevention, about healthy living, about how to understand a, a disease, those appeared in English, right? And they kind of questioned, well, why? Um, so youngsters also discussed the character of Spanish signs. And within those signs, they observed a preponderance of spelling errors, translations, you know, that were incomprehensible. And they really pointed this out. They focused in on that. And this is uh, a picture that one of the participants took. Um, so you can see that there are patients, if you need to urinate, this is a urology clinic, okay? So if you need to urinate, please ask for a specimen cup. And then in Spanish, si tiene que orinar, favor de pedir una copa para un análisis. This is what one of, the one of the students, so we asked the students to take the pictures, to write a caption, and then to come back. So this is the student's caption on that, for that picture. And he says, in a urology clinic, these signs give instructions for making appointments and providing a urine sample. This is the worst translation I've ever seen. It's difficult to understand what the, what the Spanish sign means. These kinds of signs show that there's very little interest in Spanish-speaking patients and that there's a lack of professionalism in the clinic. And you know, this was a theme that recurred over and over again, that these, these constructions of, of uh, the, these manifestations of Spanish on the linguistic landscape really created a, a message and conveyed a message about Spanish speakers and their importance and that they're not important, right? That they're, you know, that, that you know, we, we put a sign in Spanish just to put it, right? So we, we would never write a sign like that in English and put it up, right? That, that made no sense, right? But why do we do it in Spanish? And that's kind of the line of questioning that they're beginning to ask. And I, I think it's interesting to see how this idea of standards and non-standards plays out in very different ways 
within the healthcare environment. You know, so we, we talked about the impact of imposing linguistic standards and how that, that, uh, that cuts patients out from communication and excludes people who should be included in providing language access. But then you see this other side, right? Where standards also communicate something, right? They communicate a meaning. So it's, it's, it's a complex uh, area, I think. And, and these, the received notions, you know, our traditional notions of standard, non-standard, uh, I think really need to be re reanalyzed and questioned within this this uh, this uh, environment, please. And this is in the valley. This is in the valley. Is all of Mexico. Mm -hmm. so you could pick up someone in the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 that's Google. Uh -huh. There, yeah, it's probably Google. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's 90% Mexican in that region. Mm -hmm. we'll it's easier to type in Google than, than ask someone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the, the, this, I think really the conclusion was that the manifestation of Spanish on signs in the clinic revealed this underlying lack of interest in Spanish-speaking patients. And there's kind of a, a disconnect, right? Why is the, the language on the landscape, right? The language that I'm seeing and the language that I'm hearing are completely different. I walk into this place and all I hear is Spanish. But then I look around and it's nowhere to be found, right? Or it's found in these, in these particular shapes. So, um, you know, I think one of the participants stated it forcefully, and he said at the, at the end, you know, I think that hospitals need to give this more attention so that they can help people because sometimes all the hospitals see is money, but it's more than that. It's life, it's health, and well being for everyone, right? And this was kind of one of the conclusions that came out of that, out of that. Uh, that project. So I want to show you now a video that, uh, that was made kind of summarizing the project. So this is, this is just a video that summarizes the project. And we really, um, we created it to provide it to the, to the healthcare providers, right? To provide it to hospital administrators. We'll put it up on YouTube. I don't, I don't know that it got a lot of hits from <laughs> <laughs> from doctor's offices, but uh, here it is.
fue el área, fue el área donde vivimos lógicamente, sí, mucha gente acude a México, diversas razones, ¿no? Una de las, de, de las razones podía ser es el costo de ir a México, que es muy distinto el, a, el de aquí a, a, a México. Y otra de las razones también muy, muy importantes es que sienten la confianza de que van a estar atendidos por alguien que realmente les está atendiendo en su idioma. So, you know, this is this kind of sums up the the entirety of the of the project, and uh, <clears throat> you can see the student their reactions towards the end of what you know, what the way that they're interpreting this uh, this presence of Spanish on the landscape. So, the two studies that I talked about, the local interaction patterns, and then uh, you know this one on the photo voice or linguistic landscape study, I think highlight the ways in which Health language and healthcare policy is really shaped by local practices, right? I mean, it's it's shaped by the practices in which it's it's uh, it's enacted, and 
Oftentimes, this can enlarge rather than bridge the gap between Spanish speakers and the health delivery system, right? So these practices in which policy is expressed and implemented can really uh, create a greater gap than um, than what it's it the you know than than what it's intended to what the policy is intended to close. Um, so let's go to the third line of research, and that's the impact of language policy on Latino health professionals. So this is the third line of questioning uh, in my research on language and healthcare policy, looking specifically at how language policy in healthcare impacts Latino health professionals, right? So how are Latino health professionals impacted in this with the implementation of this policy? So one study looks at how organizations deploy bilingual personnel to meet the needs of Spanish-speaking patients. And another uh, more recent one looks at the impact of language surveillance and control on bilingual nurses' use of Spanish in the workplace. So we'll look at those two uh, separately and then we'll, um, we'll consider another story and finally we'll talk about training, education, and the role of Spanish educators and Spanish uh, language scholars in, in uh, language and healthcare. So the first study was a 2006 study that I conducted. It was a survey of clinics and doctor's offices in the lower Rio Grande Valley to determine the extent of and availability of bilingual personnel. The study demonstrated a hierarchical distribution of bilingual health professionals in the healthcare facilities surveyed. So the greater the level of specialization and the greater the pay rate, the less bilinguals were available. So if you look at the health workforce as kind of a pyramid with highly specialized physicians, physicians at the top and then highly specialized and more you know, family practice or internal medicine, and then you have nurses who are also uh, divided among specialized and more vocational. Uh, and then you have medical assistants and clerical staff at the lower end of the pyramid. So the greater the level of specialization, the greater the pay all the way up the pyramid, right? The less uh, availability of bilinguals. The lower the specialization and the lower the pay, the more bilinguals we found, right? So the you know medical assistants, clerical staff tended to be bilingual. There were more vocational bilingual nurses than there were RN bilingual nurses, right? And physicians, you know, an oncologist or an endocrinologist that was Spanish speaking was much less common than a family practice physician or an internal medicine uh, physician and so forth. So that that was kind of the the um, the distribution that we found. So there was less representation of bilinguals in the physician category than in the nurses category. Um, by far the largest contingent of, contingent of bilingual personnel was to be found among the medical assisting and clerical personnel. And the survey revealed that it was precisely at this level uh, of where the personnel shouldered the greatest burden for language assistance, right? So yeah, we don't have that problem in this clinic because our medical assistants are all bilingual and they do the, you know, they do the, the, the interpreting or the language access. So really what this study found was that the implementation of language policy in the lower Rio Grande Valley was really uh, largely shouldered by the least educated and the, le the least well-paid segment of the healthcare workforce, right? So um, in this study, I really wanted to point out how bilinguality and language becomes this exploitable part of being a health, uh, a healthcare professional, specifically in the Valley and how it's, you know, it's kind of connected to medical assisting and clerical staff and those uh, less paid um, uh, areas of the, of the healthcare workforce. The next study is, um, is a more recent one. And here, you know, remember I, I talked about 
the Joint Commission recommendation, the Joint Commission accreditation standards, and how that is really creating a more a more uh, tense uh, and cautious regulatory environment for hospitals. They're beginning to step up and you know try to comply with um, with language access mandates and. What we looked at was a particular hospital in Phoenix that is trying to maintain and comply with language access man mandates for accreditation purposes. And they've implemented a policy of compulsory language testing right, for all nurses, all, all personnel who, who work directly with, uh, with patients in Spanish. So, we looked particularly at nurses, and we wanted to understand the effect of this compulsory testing on Latina nurses, right? How did it affect them and their use of, of Spanish? It's important to note what that test was. So the test is actually a service. It's outsourced to the same company that provides telephone interpreting to the hospital, right? So Siricom is the company, and the company provides telephonic interpreting and provides testing to, to the hospital. So the test actually had two parts. It began with a written portion in which uh, student, uh, nurses were to demonstrate their knowledge of written Spanish, their ability to read and understand text, their ability to write you know, with uh, with uh, standard orthography to use accents in appropriate places and so forth. Once they passed that test, then they could move on to a more oral test, an oral test that looked at medical terminology and, you know, ability to, to uh, translate between uh, English and Spanish. The... Uh, what we were interested in finding is how this policy of compulsory language testing unevenly affected uh, Latina nurses. And what we found was that many of the Latina nurses that we talked to characterized the test as hard, right? Well, yeah, have you taken the test? No, no, that, that test is too hard. You know, that's, uh, it means I would have to study, I'd have to find time to kind of refresh my memory and you know I haven't written Spanish in ages so you know and that that was the 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 approach to um, to the to the testing uh, some who who did take the test indicated that they had failed it so what our interviews attempted to do was to try to determine how the policy limited the use of Spanish on the job by the, by the nurses. And while the nurses indicated uh, that they had not passed the test, they also stated that they were still compelled to provide services to Spanish-speaking patients. And this not, by, not explicitly by the hospital. The hospital was telling them, no, you're not credentialed to speak Spanish. You cannot speak Spanish. And if you do, you could be you could be sanctioned and you could lose your license as as a nurse. But yet on the floor and in practice, they were being called in by physicians and you know a doctor has a Spanish speaking patient or a resident doesn't speak Spanish. Hey, there's there's the nurse. Can you come and and help me out? So there were kind of there was this expectation that they would provide the service, right? And at the same time a, a uh, institutional mandate that sanctioned them for providing that service. So they were kind of caught in the middle. It was a conundrum uh, for them. So um, we also found that not only was the policy creating this, this, uh, this sanctioning for using Spanish 
at the same time that physician behaviors were exactly the same and they were continuing to have this expectation of calling on Latina nurses to provide the training. We also found that to, to, to provide the language services, we also found that the language testing protocol actually superseded any previous training or accreditation. Right? So one of the nurses interviewed had graduated from a well-known uh, bilingual nursing program at a local community college, right? She's, she graduated as a bilingual nurse from, from one of the local community colleges. But even so, she was not permitted to freely interact with patients in Spanish. So she had to pass the test, right? And if she didn't pass the test, she couldn't uh, speak to them. So in this study, we found that this tightening regulatory environment and the development of a stricter testing regi regime actually resulted in less availability of language access in the hospital, right? Um, so, and it, and it put the Latina nurses in this, in this very difficult position, right? Where, you know, at, at the one, on the one hand, you had this, these expectations that, you know, you're working in the hospital, you're on a care team, you're assisting and providing the support to the team that you're supposed to, right? And then on the other hand, you had hospital policy saying you're not credentialed and permitted to speak Spanish. So, and that, that's really what we're seeing with this tightening uh, regulatory environment and these, you know, these language access actually measures actually being, being uh, enforced. You're seeing that you know, rather than having a situation in which we assess what our linguistic capabilities are and what our assets are and then go from there and say okay these are my assets how do i how do we how do we deploy them in ways that are productive and beneficial and uh, add quality to the care we we simply take the we 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 impose these uh, these generic regulations and what happens is we wind up punishing Latino uh, nurses for the Spanish that they do speak and actually create, creating an environment in which Spanish is, is, uh, is avoided and less used by, by, uh, by providers. So that's the more recent uh, type of, of research that, uh, that I'm working on. Uh, and we have a paper that's uh, I did this with Carmen King de Ramirez, who's at the University of Arizona, and we have a paper that's uh, that's uh, forthcoming on that. So that's uh, this paper here, from valuable to vulnerable. Okay, so those are the two studies on providers and uh, healthcare. So, any comments on those? They cost the hospital. They cost the hospital, not the nurse. No. And they are never tested in their English grammatical skills. No, no, no. no. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Is Spanish in this, in this case of this bilingual nurse is recognized as an added skill that they can compensate? There's no for, compensation. Or, or no, no, no. I mean, you could be cleaning. Uh, yeah. The cleaning lady, but if you speak Spanish, we are going to assume you are. Prepared to interpret her? So that's what this that's what the 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 compulsory testing is trying to control, right? So the compulsory testing is trying to say, okay, we need to figure out a way to ensure that everyone who's interacting with Spanish speaking patients is capable of doing so. Right. There's no extra compensation for it. No, 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 no bonus. No, nothing. Yeah, yeah. And remember that I, I think the the in the language access mandates that I talked about. You know that that inclusion of at no cost was really it really you know created a situation in which the policy couldn't really be effective. Right. I mean, either Congress would need to make this an act and appropriate funding for it or you know it would have to it would have to be you know there have to be some mechanism 
to fund language access, right? And they're, they're, the, the absence of that mechanism has really led to, led to significant um, lack of progress, I think. And, uh, yeah. The, the test, who is, is the standard, who provides that? So the test in this particular, in this particular uh, hospital, it was provided by the same company that provided the telephonic interpreting services. So there, there are maybe three or four major telephonic interpreting companies, right? So you have Siricom, you have Language Line, you have Lionbridge Technologies, and they really are organizations that cover insurance, social services, hospitals, schools, you know, they cover anything, right? And a, a telephonic interpreter, one minute will be interpreting for a nephrologist, another minute will be interpreting for a counselor. So they really just span the whole spectrum of any potential interactions, right? And uh, so the same company that provided the telephonic services is the company that developed and provided the test, right? The test was a written grammar orthography test as sort of a screener. Are you, and the question that they're trying to answer with that test is, are you proficient in Spanish? And the definition of proficiency is not the definition that clearly is used worldwide to talk about proficiency. We talk about ACTFL or we use the common European framework or, you know, something that measures function and ability to to utilize the language in different uh, contexts. But instead of using that, they had this written test, which is grammar and orthography. So once you establish proficiency, then you can move on to testing interpreter abilities, right? So the oral test was more, they would give you scenarios that give you a sentence and you translate it from English to Spanish, from Spanish to English, and they would check the accuracy or, you know, the, the, the precision. Yeah, 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 yeah. So very similar to the national certification exams for, for interpreters um, in terms of the interpreting test. Now, the national certification doesn't have any, any prescribed way of showing proficiency. You can do it with an actful OPI score, you can do it with a DELE score, you can do it with coursework or, you know, credits in Spanish. So there are different ways of, of showing it in, the, in terms of the national certification for interpreters. Um, but this particular hospital was doing it that way. So, you know, if it were, if it were national certification, this, this one nurse who had a degree, her nursing degree was in bilingual nursing, she would have, with that, she would have shown her proficiency and been able to to take the oral test, which would be more, you know, more appropriate, I think, for her, right, in terms of, you know, having to go back and study, you know, what the rules of accents are, and, you know, that's, it, it's kind of ridiculous to ask the, the nurses to do that, so. Is there a difference with, with someone that's first language is Spanish and that's interpreting into English, or someone's at first language is in English, it's like you're going to be interpreting into Spanish. It's there, I, I, uh, uh. They talk about A language and B language, uh, and you know you should translate into your A language or interpret into your A language. Um, I think it becomes really complicated when we think about Latinos in the U.S., right? And you know what, what is my A language? I, I, I don't know. You know, what's my B language? Well, <laughs> depends when, right? <laughs> depends what I'm talking about, right? So I, I, I don't know that that's been uh, that really in 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 highly bilingual um, context that that is really applicable. You know, I think it's more uh, specialized and, and you know where where the A and B language are are truly first and second, right? Um, which may not be the case for, for m much of the Latino population. Um, 
you know, I think that there are, there are ways that we can more effectively utilize and leverage the language abilities that exist in the clinic, right? And, and, and the workforce, right? And take that and use that to, to wisely uh, develop a, a language access and language acceptance strategy, right, for, for Latino um, patients and Spanish-speaking patients. So let's look at another uh, story, and this will be the last one. This is Arturo Emanuel's story. And I want you to think about the implications for training health professionals, right, through this story. So what are, what are the implications for training health professionals? And then we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Durante nueve meses, Gisela se ilusionó profundamente con el pequeño bebé que estaba procreando en su vientre. Todo marchaba a la perfección. Sin embargo, en su última cita con el ginecólogo, le avisaron que se le iba a tener que hacer una cesárea de emergencia debido a que su bebé se le paraba el corazón. Por es que miran, de cuenta que su cuerpecito, el oxígeno en su cuerpecito ya no fluía bien. De un 100% llegaba al 66%. Y lo más que llegó fue un 88 y de ahí fue como que empezó todo. Le pusieron sondas, le pusieron inyecciones, tratamientos en los cuales no tenía, o sea, no tenía idea de lo que era. Después lo tenían todo entubado, lo tenían sedado. Imagínate un niño tan chiquito con un chorro de sedantes. No me dejaban tocarlo ni me explicaban lo que tenía. Eso era, era lo, mi angustia porque, o sea, ver a mi niño así y ni siquiera sabía lo que tenía. Y pues nada más de repente llegó una enfermera que medio hablaba español, porque ni siquiera lo hablaba bien. Medio me explicó que mi niño tenía las venas invertidas, las venitas de su corazón, y, y que lo tenían que trasladar a San Antonio. Cuando llegó a San Antonio, todo fue diferente. Había cardiólogos que hablaban español y se tomaban el tiempo para explicar cada procedimiento que se le administraba a su bebé. Ahí en el hospital de McAllen, varias veces dejó de respirar y era yo la que le tenía que hablar a las enfermeras para que lo vinieran a comer. De hecho, una de las veces contrajo una infección que fue lo que hizo que le dio de empeorada y era porque lo tenían demasiado tiempo entubado. En San Antonio, al pequeño se le hizo una cirugía de corazón abierto. Cuando aparentemente ya estaba bien, lo regresaron a McAllen ya solo a recuperarse. Más cinco días después de ser trasladado, de nuevo empezó a decaer por completo y a batallar con la respiración. La doctora le avisó a Gisela que ya no sabían qué hacer y lo regresaron a San Antonio. Cuando regresamos a San Antonio, los doctores estaban bien sorprendidos porque no se explicaba si ellos no habían regresado al hospital de Macal en estable, cómo, cómo era posible que el niño regresara aún peor de la, que la primera vez. Eso era lo que les sorprendía a ellos. El doctor le explicó a Gisela que lo que Arturito tenía era que un lado de su diafragma estaba paralizado por la operación del corazón y era el motivo por el cual estaba batallando para respirar. Lo estaba atendiendo un especialista de la garganta, ya que en McAllen se le habían irritado e hinchado los pulmones al entubarlo. Pero durante este tiempo se le empezó a acumular líquido en sus pulmoncitos y el doctor iba a intentar extraerlo con una jeringa. Mi enfermera me dijo que me saliera del cuarto de las incubadoras, pero que no me no quiere salir. Al momento de que le pusieron una jeringa en su pecho, le empezaron a sacar un líquido, empecé a ver cómo mi bebé se desangraba y la, la, le empezó a bajar un chorro la presión. Además, vi como anunciaron el código azul, de repente pues en una idea como 10 enfermeros y 5 doctores. Ya solo me veía como me hacían compresiones de pecho y, y su cuerpecito se ponía morado. Así estuvieron como 40 minutos, pero mi mamá ya, ya no respondió. Con aproximadamente un 93% de una población latina hispanohablante, es realmente una lástima que en el Valle haya tanta necesidad de doctores capacitados, no solo en medicina, 
sino el lenguaje y cultura para darle a los familiares y los pacientes un cuidado de calidad. Tal vez fue negligencia médica, tal vez solo fue el plan de Dios, más la desesperación y amarga angustia que pasaba Gisela al no saber qué tenía su pequeño pudo ser disminuida si tan solo los doctores le hubiesen dicho que estaban haciendo su mayor esfuerzo y no dejándolo con la idea de que su bebé estaba siendo mal atendido. Those are the stakes, right? Um, I was very interested in the way that she connected the story to training, right? To <laughs> why can't we ensure that our healthcare workforce is capable not only of treating but also of communicating? Right? And also of providing um, knowledge and messages to to uh, to patients so that you know they will understand right so that they'll at least know that you're trying your best right you know so that's that's uh, uh, I, I thought that that was a very powerful uh, story and a very moving one Sochi actually is now doing a uh, a PhD in public health at George Washington in, uh, in uh, DC. Um, but yeah, so how do we how do we approach this training issue? And let me just uh, share with you some of my thoughts. So um, I used to think about medical Spanish, and I've kind of moved away from that. A bit. I don't like the term medical Spanish. I think we need to think in broader, in broader uh, terms. I think that medical Spanish really focuses in on lexicon, right, and advanced grammar, the kinds of things that we were talking about before. I think we need to broaden it out and think more about, you know, Spanish for the health professions or Spanish in the health professions or even Spanish through the health professions, which is kind of the direction I'm moving in these days. So thinking about, okay, how do we distribute language instruction throughout the curriculum? How do we distribute it? So we, we want to serve our pre-med Spanish majors, right? But what happens when we finish? Do we leave them at the door of medical school and say bye-bye? Or do we also engage productively with medical schools and engage productively with nursing schools and engage productively with other professional uh, schools that are training health professionals? And how do we engage, right? What does that instruction look like, right? What, what are the objectives and goals that are best pursued at the undergraduate level and what are the objectives and goals in language and language development that we can we can uh, develop and deploy when students are in you know more advanced stages and have better clinical knowledge i think that there's a there's a disconnect in the way that we teach Spanish and the health professions, you know, with, with uh, dialogues and simulations of patient care and clinical, clinical uh, you know, medical interviews with undergraduate students who have no idea how to do a medical interview, right? They have no idea how to do a health assessment, you know? So why are we having them practice doing this in Spanish at that point when they still don't have the clinical skills? So what I'm arguing for is more of a a um, articulation of language skills and clinical knowledge and how do those things go together across the pipeline. So, you know, at, at UT Pan American, my, my, uh, my work was mostly with undergrads and at Ohio State, I've been doing more and more with, with, the, 
with this, the College of Nursing, the College of Medicine, and trying to, I think that that's really what shaped my, my view of this, you know, more holistic uh, approach to teaching Spanish through the health professions, right? Uh, so, you know, in the undergraduate, we can deal with more cultural things. We can deal with the big questions that shape, right, the language skills. And then in the professional schools, we really draw on what they've, what they're developing in terms of clinical assessment, in terms of conducting a medical interview, in terms of delivering a diagnosis, right? So how do we, you know, once they learn how to do this within the context of their professional training, well, how do they do it in Spanish, right? And, and deliver the instruction in that way. So that, that's my, my thinking moving forward, you know, kind of a, a pedagogy coming out of this policy research. Uh, just in terms of the policy research itself, uh, in the in the informe that's that's available out there, I talk about patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research, which is is the the direction of health services research today. It's, you know, it used to be that we would focus on evidence-based care, so we want to know. If we have a intervention, if we have a treatment, what is its evidence base? How effective is it? You know, and at what, at what statistical level is it effective? And today, I think there's a new view, which instead of focusing on the effect, the the efficacy of a particular intervention and defining that intervention as a standard of care, rather we're saying, okay, we have three or four possible treatments, three or four possible interventions, and we have a patient with a unique background, unique beliefs, a unique uh, physical condition, what is the best option for that patient? And that's the idea of patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. So taking different comparators and seeing, okay, which one is better when and to what extent, right? And um, I think that there really is a future in applying this model to the way that we provide language access, right? So there are certain times and certain procedures and certain interactions that require or are best uh, suited to certain types of language assistance and that, that promote language acceptance, like we were talking about at the beginning, right? So there are, I think that, that we can apply patient-centered uh, outcomes research to, uh, to language assistance in ways that really allow us to understand and leverage both the skills that we have within uh, hospitals and also understand how to distribute right, those skills across the continuum of care and across the different kinds of interactions that patients have. One of the hallmarks of patient-centered outcomes research is the inclusion of patients in the research itself, right? And that, that I think, is a, is a very uh, unique approach and could really take language access research into, into uncharted territory and very, asking very exciting questions. What's, what's important to patients? Right? What what do they want? You know, what is, what does a patient what does a patient think in terms of, you know, how they how they interact and how does language shape their their encounter? And that's what we've seen in all of these stories, right? So, you know, in, in moving forward in, in language access research, um, I'm really looking forward to to uh, using these models to bring patients in to asking the research questions, right? Not simply being subjects of research, but also being participants, right? So that's, that's kind of the future of, uh, of where this is taking me. So we can open it to a discussion that we have about 10 minutes or so to, about uh, training and the things that you're doing. So I know that uh, many of you are, are working with, uh, on projects. I think we need to really get out of the mode in which Spanish or medical Spanish is, you know, this course that students take and that's it, they're ready. You know, it's, it's not. It's something we need to think about across the, the educational continuum. Yeah? 
glad you raised so many kids here. You could be here for two days. Uh, and I have two very different questions. One is for our training. What is happening with us at UMass? At UMass, we started making that certificate program because there were nursing students who wanted to minor. Mm -hmm. just to develop their language skills mm -hmm. and then we had to kind of fit them and they yeah. have a very heavy schedule too. yeah yeah like, do you really need to take spanish literature of the 20th century or colonial latin american literature do you need these requirements for the nurses mm -hmm. so we created a totally different program for them still based on the minor mm -hmm. they still have to take mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. culture class whatever it yeah. is the medical Spanish, then they take, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, because these nurses do not have time in their schedules. They have to be in rotations, mm -hmm. and in this, and in that, and the other. Like, I would love them to go abroad, and there are now more study abroad programs uh, mm -hmm. with health-related fields and with internships, and we are looking into those things too. It makes perfect sense, the argument that you're making of integrating both, mm -hmm. but I, at mm -hmm. least at UMass, the professional school does not give them the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that's a great question. So how do you actually pursue this integration? And you need to, one, have more intimate collaboration with clinicians, right? So one thing that I found in the, you know, the graduate nursing program is just as tight, you know, just as, as you know, impenetrable as the undergraduate, right? So, you know, nurse, nursing programs are, are infamous for being so, so packed because of accreditation and because of, you know, licensing and so forth. What we've done at the graduate level is say, okay, you know, you need, you know, 40, 40 credits of clinical hours. Well, why can't five of those be clinical practice in Spanish, right? And then you begin, you begin interacting with clinicians. So I'm not capable of, of directing a clinical class, right? But you work with a clinician and the clinician is directing the clinical, you know, skills, and I'm looking at the language skills, right? So it's it's this this uh, the, this really embedded collaboration between between the two schools, and you need to get you need to get buy-in, but you can do it. You know, it can be, and and I think that that's what that's what nursing schools and and professional schools can be persuaded to do. You know, we're not saying, okay, add on another, you know, 12 didactic hours to an already packed curriculum. We're saying, you know, let's combine two GE classes with one additional class and have this experience out in Holyoke, right, <laughs> that, that will count both as Spanish and as clinical credit at the same time, right? Yeah. We have also medical and nurse schools should uh, promote already bilingual uh, speakers to with lower tuitions to be able to access to medical school, nurse sure, school. Sure. They already know what languages, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't have the resources to apply to these schools. Yeah. yeah so that yeah. should be another mm -hmm. yeah. way to grant mm -hmm. building, access. Building the pipeline has always been, you know, how do we widen the pipeline of of you know, bilinguals into the medical professions. Yeah. Why only physicians or the pyramid that you show? Yeah. The higher the pyramid, the less bilingual skills mm -hmm. because only they have the exactly. access yeah. to yeah. these type of careers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So why can't we think of pathways for medical assistants to ascend to to physicians? Right? Why can't we think of pathways to get Latino high school students with advanced proficiency in Spanish? Why can't we make them interpreters, 
have them certified interpreters upon graduation from high school, work their way through a health degree in college as an interpreter, and then move on to become a, you know, to become a physician. So I, I think that there are pipeline issues and we can view language skills as the, as the catalyst you know, towards that pipeline. Yeah. you have such brilliant students working for you at Pan America, mm -hmm. uh, it's full of Spanish. What happens? The doctors, the Macalian kids end up working in San Antonio once they become doctors? In, uh, in the past, the Macalian kids just weren't getting in, you know, so traditionally, the, these are bright kids and, you know, what, what we showed with the program so at Pan American, we developed a minor in Spanish. We called it Medical Spanish for Heritage Learners, uh, similar to the, the same issues you were finding, right? Students wanted to minor in Spanish, and they were, they were majoring in nursing and, and medicine and so forth. So we created that minor. Um, and we did some analysis. We were, we were funded by the Department of Education, so we had to do you know, some, some analysis and figure out, okay, what's the impact? So we looked at language development and we found that you know students were developing at a very accelerated rate they were able to do things with language that you know they weren't able to do before so we were doing the pre and post but we also looked at other things we looked at science gpa so what what impact does studying spanish in the health professions have on your gpa in biochemistry organic chemistry and uh, anatomy and physiology, right? And we looked at these courses and we compared the, the grade point averages and we found that students who had taken medical Spanish raised their grade point average by 0.2 grade points, right? So they had higher grade point averages in science because they were taking, you know, connected to, this, to these courses in medical Spanish. Now, why would that be? Well, you know, in part because we're responding to an interest, right? We are cultivating an interest. And now organic chemistry is, is, is connected to other things, right? It's connected to, you know, another set of vocabulary, another set of interests, another uh, direction, and so forth. So we found that. And then we looked also at MCAT scores. And we found that students who were in the program had improved MCAT scores, particularly in the in the verbal like area. GRE. Yeah, it's a GRE for it's your it's your medical school entrance exam, right? Uh, so we found that it also contributed to that, right? So, um, but yeah, I think that I think that it it's you know doing this kind of work is is also contributing to the pipeline, right? And also you know providing greater success for students to become the physicians of tomorrow and with with this kind of knowledge, right? With this, you know, if you make a video like that, <laughs> you, know, you have to learn something, right? And you know, you have to have really have, have a, you have sort of this perspective on the role of language, right? And in, in healthcare that otherwise wouldn't be there. You certainly wouldn't get it in your traditional medical Spanish textbook, right? Um, yeah. So, other comments? Why, I'd like to know what you're doing in terms of Spanish in the health profession. So you're in, uh, in New Hampshire or, or in uh, Boston College and other places that are, what's, what's going on there in terms of what, what, how you're developing um, coursework? Because um, the things you were, you were talking about, about, about the schedule for the nursing program, you know, we were, it was really difficult to find like a room for a Spanish uh, courses per se. So this is why we created this minor in Spanish and nursing program. Yeah. So yeah. it's just a, it's mm -hmm. a new one, yeah. 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 We, couldn't, we couldn't figure out what to do. And then their interest is, is high, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, so we are creating, we are starting a new program. Mm -hmm. 
It's great. It's classes. Yeah. yeah, and there is another component that is just some um, uh, internship or some like uh, I don't know practicing in Costa Rica as well mm -hmm. for months mm -hmm. in the summer. So yeah. it's very appealing for the students too. Yeah. Yeah. And you know that that again is the the importance of thinking across the development. So study abroad, you know, it's it's not possible once you're in the the nursing program, but maybe you can think about it before, right? So, you know, nor normally they'll the students will apply to a nursing program and they enter when they're a junior, right? They enter into the nursing program. They're doing pre-nursing before that, but why not target the students before that? So all the pre-nurse, let's have a pre-nursing program to Costa Rica, you know, that kind of thing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but I, I think if we, if we think across the spectrum of training, we can really find these opportunities to, to enrich it. We doesn't, everything doesn't have to be in a semester. Everything doesn't have to be in a year, you know. <laughs> it, can be, it can be spread out, you know, across the... The other thing is we have students in psychology, public health, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nutrition, kinesiology. Mm -hmm. All these students are interested mm -hmm. in our program. Yeah. So in yeah. general, we will have to change things. With yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What about at Boston College? What's going on? We don't have a, as far as, no, 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 no